Intensive animal farming or industrial livestock production, also known as factory farming, is a production approach towards farm animals in order to maximize production output, while minimizing production costs. Intensive farming refers to animal husbandry, the keeping of livestock such as cattle, poultry, and fish at higher stocking densities than is usually the case with other forms of animal agriculture, a practice typical in industrial farming by agribusinesses. The main products of this industry are meat, milk and eggs for human consumption. There are issues regarding whether factory farming is sustainable or ethical. Confinement at high stocking density is one part of a systematic effort to produce the highest output at the lowest cost by relying on economies of scale, modern machinery, biotechnology, and global trade. There are differences in the way factory farming techniques are practiced around the world. There is a continuing debate over the benefits, risks, and ethical questions of factory farming. The issues include the efficiency of food production, animal welfare, and the environmental impact e.g. agricultural pollution and health risks. Topic: History. The practice of industrial animal agriculture is a relatively recent development in the history of agriculture and the result of scientific discoveries and technological advances. Innovations in agriculture beginning in the late 19th century generally parallel developments in mass production in other industries that characterized the latter part of the Industrial Revolution. The discovery of vitamins and their role in animal nutrition, in the first two decades of the 20th century, led to vitamin supplements, which allowed chickens to be raised indoors. The discovery of antibiotics and vaccines facilitated raising livestock in larger numbers by reducing disease. Chemicals developed for use in World War II gave rise to synthetic pesticides. Developments in shipping networks and technology have made long-distance distribution of agricultural produce feasible. Agricultural production across the world doubled four times between 1820 and 1975 1820 to 1920, 1920 to 1950, 1950 to 1965, and 1965 to 1975 to feed a global population of 1 billion human beings in 1806.5 billion in 2002. During the same period, the number of people involved in farming dropped as the process became more automated. In the 1930s, 24% of the American population worked in agriculture compared to 1.5% in 2002. In 1940, each farm worker supplied 11 consumers, whereas in 2002, each worker supplied 90 consumers. According to the BBC, the era factory farming per se in Britain began in 1947 when a new Agriculture Act granted subsidies to farmers to encourage greater output by introducing new technology, in order to reduce Britain's reliance on imported meat. The United Nations writes that intensification of animal production was seen as a way of providing food security." In 1966, the United States, United Kingdom and other industrialized nations, commenced factory farming of beef and dairy cattle and domestic pigs. From its American and West European heartland factory farming became globalized in the later years of the 20th century and is still expanding and replacing traditional practices of stock rearing in an increasing number of countries. In 1990 factory farming accounted for 30% of world meat production and by 2005 this had risen to 40%. <laughs> == <laughs> Contemporary animal production Factory farms hold large numbers of animals, typically cows, pigs, turkeys, or chickens, often indoors, typically at high densities. The aim of the operation is to produce large quantities of meat, eggs, or milk at the lowest possible cost. Food is supplied in place. Methods employed to maintain health and improve production may include some combination of disinfectants, antimicrobial agents, anthelmintics, hormones and vaccines, protein, mineral and vitamin supplements, frequent health inspections, biosecurity, climate-controlled facilities and other measures. Physical restraints, e.g. fences or creeps, are used to control movement or actions regarded as undesirable. Breeding programs are used to produce animals more suited to the confined conditions and able to provide a consistent food product. Intensive production of livestock and poultry is widespread in developed nations. For 2002 2003, FAO estimates of industrial production as a percentage of global production were 7% for beef and veal, 0.8% for sheep and goat meat, 42% for pork, and 67% for poultry meat. Industrial production was estimated to account for 39% of the sum of global production of these meats and 50% of total egg production. In the U.S., according to its National Pork Producers Council, 80 million of its 95 million pigs slaughtered each year are reared in industrial settings. <laughs> Chickens 
In the United States, chickens were raised primarily on family farms until 1965. Originally, the primary value in poultry was eggs, and meat was considered a byproduct of egg production. Its supply was less than the demand, and poultry was expensive. Except in hot weather, eggs can be shipped and stored without refrigeration for some time before going bad, this was important in the days before widespread refrigeration. Farm flocks tended to be small because the hens largely fed themselves through foraging, with some supplementation of grain, scraps, and waste products from other farm ventures. Such feedstuffs were in limited supply, especially in the winter, and this tended to regulate the size of the farm flocks. Soon after poultry keeping gained the attention of agricultural researchers around 1896, improvements in nutrition and management made poultry keeping more profitable and businesslike. Prior to about 1910, chicken was served primarily on special occasions or Sunday dinner. Poultry was shipped live or killed, plucked, and packed on ice, but not eviscerated. The whole, ready-to-cook broiler was not popular until the 1950s, when end-to-end -end refrigeration and sanitary practices gave consumers more confidence. Before this, poultry were often cleaned by the neighborhood butcher, though cleaning poultry at home was a commonplace kitchen skill. Two kinds of poultry were generally used, broilers or spring chickens. Young male chickens, a byproduct of the egg industry, which were sold when still young and tender, generally under three pounds live weight, and stewing hens, also a byproduct of the egg industry, which were old hens past their prime for laying. The major milestone in 20th century poultry production was the discovery of vitamin D, which made it possible to keep chickens in confinement year-round. Before this, chickens did not thrive during the winter due to lack of sunlight, and egg production, incubation, and meat production in the off-season were all very difficult, making poultry a seasonal and expensive proposition. Year-round production lowered costs, especially for broilers. At the same time, egg production was increased by scientific breeding. After a few false starts, such as the main experiment station's failure at improving egg production success was shown by Professor Dryden at the Oregon Experiment Station, improvements in production and quality were accompanied by lower labor requirements. In the 1930s through the early 1950s, 1,500 hens was considered to be a full-time job for a farm family. In the late 1950s, egg prices had fallen so dramatically that farmers typically tripled the number of hens they kept, putting three hens into what had been a single bird cage or converting their floor confinement houses from a single deck of roosts to triple decker roosts. Not long after this, prices fell still further and large numbers of egg farmers left the business. Robert Plamondon reports that the last family chicken farm in his part of Oregon, Rex Farms, had 30,000 layers and survived into the 1990s. However the standard laying house of the current operators is around 125,000 hens. This fall in profitability was accompanied by a general fall in prices to the consumer, allowing poultry and eggs to lose their status as luxury foods. The vertical integration of the egg and poultry industries was a late development, occurring after all the major technological changes had been in place for years including the development of modern broiler rearing techniques, the adoption of the Cornish cross broiler, the use of laying cages, etc. By the late 1950s, poultry production had changed dramatically. Large farms and packing plants could grow birds by the tens of thousands. Chickens could be sent to slaughterhouses for butchering and processing into prepackaged commercial products to be frozen or shipped fresh to markets or wholesalers. Meat-type chickens currently grow to market weight in six to seven weeks, whereas only 50 years ago it took three times as long. This is due to genetic selection and nutritional modifications but not the use of growth hormones, which are illegal for use in poultry in the U.S. and many other countries. Once a meat consumed only occasionally, the common availability and lower cost has made chicken a common meat product within developed nations. Growing concerns over the cholesterol content of red meat in the 1980s and 1990s further resulted in increased consumption of chicken. Today, eggs are produced on large egg ranches on which environmental parameters are well controlled. Chickens are exposed to artificial light cycles to stimulate egg production year-round. In addition, forced molting is commonly practiced, in which manipulation of light and food access triggers molting, with the goal of increased egg size and production. Forced molting is controversial. While it is widespread in the U.S., it is prohibited in the EU. On average, a chicken lays one egg a day, but not on every day of the year. This varies with the breed and time of year. In 1900, average egg production was 83 eggs per hen per year. In 2000, it was well over 300. In the United States, laying hens are butchered after their second egg-laying season. In Europe, they are generally butchered after a single season. The laying period begins when the hen is about 18 to 20 weeks old, depending on breed and season. 
Males of the egg type breeds have little commercial value at any age, and all those not used for breeding roughly 50% of all egg type chickens are killed soon after hatching. The old hens also have little commercial value. Thus, the main sources of poultry meat 100 years ago spring chickens and stewing hens have both been entirely supplanted by meat-type broiler chickens. Some believe that the deadly H5N1 strain of bird flu is essentially a problem of industrial poultry practices. On the other hand, according to the CDC article H5N1 Outbreaks and Enzootic Influenza by Robert G. Webster et al., Transmission of highly pathogenic H5N1 from domestic poultry back to migratory waterfowl in western China has increased the geographic spread. The spread of H5N1 and its likely reintroduction to domestic poultry increase the need for good agricultural vaccines. In fact, the root cause of the continuing H5N1 pandemic threat may be the way the pathogenicity of H5N1 viruses is masked by co-circulating influenza viruses or bad agricultural vaccines. Webster explains, if you use a good vaccine you can prevent the transmission within poultry and to humans. But if they have been using vaccines now in China for several years, why is there so much bird flu? There is bad vaccine that stops the disease in the bird but the bird goes on pooping out virus and maintaining it and changing it. And I think this is what is going on in China. It has to be. Either there is not enough vaccine being used or there is substandard vaccine being used. Probably both. It's not just China. We can't blame China for substandard vaccines. I think there are substandard vaccines for influenza in poultry all over the world. In response to the same concerns, Reuters reports Hong Kong infectious disease expert Lo Wing Lok saying that the issue of vaccines has to take top priority. And Julie Hall, in charge of the WHO's outbreak response in China, saying that China's vaccinations might be masking the virus. The BBC reported that Wendy Barclay, a virologist at the University of Reading, UK, said, the Chinese have made a vaccine based on reverse genetics made with H5N1 antigens, and they have been using it. There has been a lot of criticism of what they have done, because they have protected their chickens against death from this virus but the chickens still get infected, and then you get drift, the virus mutates in response to the antibodies, and now we have a situation where we have five or six flavors of H5N1 out there. Keeping wild birds away from domestic birds is known to be key in the fight against H5N1. Caging no free-range poultry is one way. Providing wild birds with restored wetlands so they naturally choose non-livestock areas is another way that helps accomplish this. Political forces are increasingly demanding the selection of one, the other, or both based on non-scientific reasons. Topic. Pigs Intensive piggeries or hog lots, are a type of concentrated animal feeding operation specialized for the raising of domestic pigs up to slaughter weight. In this system of pig production grower pigs are housed indoors in group housing or straw line sheds, whilst pregnant sows are confined in sow stalls gestation crates, and give birth in farrowing crates. The use of sow stalls gestation crates, has resulted in lower production costs, however, this practice has led to more significant animal welfare concerns. Many of the world's largest producers of pigs US and Canada use sow stalls, but some nations e the UK, and some US states e Florida and Arizona, have banned them. Intensive piggeries are generally large warehouse-like buildings. Indoor pig systems allow the pig's condition to be monitored, ensuring minimum fatalities and increased productivity. Buildings are ventilated and their temperature regulated. Most domestic pig varieties are susceptible to heat stress, and all pigs lack sweat glands and cannot cool themselves. Pigs have a limited tolerance to high temperatures and heat stress can lead to death. Maintaining a more specific temperature within the pig tolerance range also maximizes growth and growth to feed ratio. In an intensive operation pigs will lack access to a wallow mud, which is their natural cooling mechanism. Intensive piggeries control temperature through ventilation or drip water systems dropping water to cool the system. Pigs are naturally omnivorous and are generally fed a combination of grains and protein sources soybeans, or meat and bone meal. Larger intensive pig farms may be surrounded by farmland where feed grain crops are grown. Alternatively, piggeries are reliant on the grains industry. Pig feed may be bought packaged or mixed on site. The intensive piggery system, where pigs are confined in individual stalls, allows each pig to be allotted a portion of feed. The individual feeding system also facilitates individual medication of pigs through feed. This has more significance to intensive farming methods, as the close proximity to other animals enables diseases to spread more rapidly. To prevent disease spreading and encourage growth, drug programs such as antibiotics, vitamins, hormones and other supplements are preemptively administered. 
Indoor systems, especially stalls and pens i.e., dry, not straw-lined systems allow for the easy collection of waste. In an indoor-intensive pig farm, manure can be managed through a lagoon system or other waste management system. However, odor remains a problem which is difficult to manage. The way animals are housed in intensive systems varies. Breeding sows will spend the bulk of their time in sow stalls also called gestation crates during pregnancy or farrowing crates, with litter, until market. Piglets often receive range of treatments including castration, tail docking to reduce tail biting, teeth clipped to reduce injuring their mother's nipples and prevent later tusk growth and their ears notched to assist identification. Treatments are usually made without painkillers. Weak runts may be slain shortly after birth. Piglets also may be weaned and removed from the sows at between 2 and 5 weeks old and placed in sheds. However, grower pigs, which comprise the bulk of the herd, are usually housed in alternative indoor housing, such as batch pens. During pregnancy, the use of a stall may be preferred as it facilitates feed management and growth control. It also prevents pig aggression e.g. tail biting, ear biting, vulva biting, food stealing. Group pens generally require higher stockmanship skills. Such pens will usually not contain straw or other material. Alternatively, a straw line shed may house a larger group i.e. not batched in age groups. Many countries have introduced laws to regulate treatment of farmed animals. In the USA, the Federal Humane Slaughter Act requires pigs to be stunned before slaughter, although compliance and enforcement is questioned. Topic: <coughs> Cattle. Cattle are domesticated ungulates, a member of the family Bovidae, in the subfamily Bovini, and descended from the aurochs Bos primigenius. They are raised as livestock for meat called beef and veal, dairy products milk, leather and as draft animals pulling carts, plows and the like. In some countries, such as India, they are honored in religious ceremonies and revered. As of 2009-2010 it is estimated that there are 1.3 to 1.4 billion head of cattle in the world. Cattle are often raised by allowing herds to graze on the grasses of large tracts of rangeland called ranches. Raising cattle in this manner allows the productive use of land that might be unsuitable for growing crops. The most common interactions with cattle involve daily feeding, cleaning and milking. Many routine husbandry practices involve ear tagging, dehorning, loading, medical operations, vaccinations and hoof care, as well as training for agricultural shows and preparations. There are also some cultural differences in working with cattle. The cattle husbandry of Fulani men rests on behavioral techniques, whereas in Europe cattle are controlled primarily by physical means like fences. Once cattle obtain an entry level weight, about 650 pounds, 290 kilograms, they are transferred from the range to a feedlot to be fed a specialized animal feed which consists of corn byproducts derived from ethanol production, barley, and other grains as well as alfalfa and cottonseed meal. The feed also contains premixes composed of microingredients such as vitamins, minerals, chemical preservatives, antibiotics, fermentation products, and other essential ingredients that are purchased from premix companies, usually in sacked form, for blending into commercial rations. Because of the availability of these products, a farmer using their own grain can formulate their own rations and be assured the animals are getting the recommended levels of minerals and vitamins. Breeders can utilize cattle husbandry to reduce M. bovis infection susceptibility by selective breeding and maintaining herd health to avoid concurrent disease. Cattle are farmed for beef, veal, dairy, leather and they are sometimes used simply to maintain grassland for wildlife, for example, in Epping Forest, England. They are often used in some of the most wild places for livestock. Depending on the breed, cattle can survive on hill grazing, heaths, marshes, moors and semi-desert. Modern cows are more commercial than older breeds and having become more specialized are less versatile. For this reason many smaller farmers still favor old breeds, such as the dairy breed of cattle jersey. There are many potential impacts on human health due to the modern cattle industrial agriculture system. There are concerns surrounding the antibiotics and growth hormones used, increased E. coli contamination, higher saturated fat contents in the meat because of the feed, and also environmental concerns. As of 2010, in the U.S. 766, 350 producers participate in raising beef. The beef industry is segmented with the bulk of the producers participating in raising beef calves. Beef calves are generally raised in small herds, with over 90% of the herds having less than 100 head of cattle. Fewer producers participate in the finishing phase which often occurs in a feedlot, but nonetheless there are 82,170 feedlots in the United States. Aquaculture Aquaculture is the cultivation of the natural produce of water fish, shellfish, algae and other aquatic organisms. 
The term is distinguished from fishing by the idea of active human effort in maintaining or increasing the number of organisms involved, as opposed to simply taking them from the wild. Subsets of aquaculture include mariculture, aquaculture in the ocean, algaculture, the production of kelp, seaweed and other algae, fish farming, the raising of catfish, tilapia and milkfish in freshwater and brackish ponds or salmon in marine ponds, and the growing of cultured pearls. Extensive aquaculture is based on local photosynthetical production while intensive aquaculture is based on fish fed with an external food supply. Aquaculture has been used since ancient times and can be found in many cultures. Aquaculture was used in China C. 2500 BC. When the waters lowered after river floods, some fishes, mainly carp, were held in artificial lakes. Their brood were later fed using nymphs and silkworm feces, while the fish themselves were eaten as a source of protein. The Hawaiian people practiced aquaculture by constructing fish ponds see Hawaiian aquaculture. A remarkable example from ancient Hawaii is the construction of a fish pond, dating from at least 1,000 years ago, at Alakoko. The Japanese practiced cultivation of seaweed by providing bamboo poles and, later, nets and oyster shells to serve as anchoring surfaces for spores. The Romans often bred fish in ponds. The practice of aquaculture gained prevalence in Europe during the Middle Ages, since fish were scarce and thus expensive. However, improvements in transportation during the 19th century made fish easily available and inexpensive, even in inland areas, causing a decline in the practice. The first North American fish hatchery was constructed on Dildo Island, Newfoundland, Canada in 1889. It was the largest and most advanced in the world. Americans were rarely involved in aquaculture until the late 20th century, but California residents harvested wild kelp and made legal efforts to manage the supply starting c. 1900, later even producing it as a wartime resource. In contrast to agriculture, the rise of aquaculture is a contemporary phenomenon. According to Professor Carlos M. Duarte about 430 97% of the aquatic species presently in culture have been domesticated since the start of the 20th century, and an estimated 106 aquatic species have been domesticated over the past decade. The domestication of an aquatic species typically involves about a decade of scientific research. Current success in the domestication of aquatic species results from the 20th century rise of knowledge on the basic biology of aquatic species and the lessons learned from past success and failure. The stagnation in the world's fisheries and over-exploitation of 20 to 30 percent of marine fish species have provided additional impetus to domesticate marine species, just as over-exploitation of land animals provided the impetus for the early domestication of land species. In the 1960s, the price of fish began to climb, as wild fish capture rates peaked and the human population continued to rise. Today, commercial aquaculture exists on an unprecedented, huge scale. In the 1980s, open netcage salmon farming also expanded. This particular type of aquaculture technology remains a minor part of the production of farmed finfish worldwide, but possible negative impacts on wild stocks, which have come into question since the late 1990s, have caused it to become a major cause of controversy. In 2003, the total world production of fisheries product was 132.2 million tons, of which aquaculture contributed 41.9 million tons, or about 31% of the total world production. The growth rate of worldwide aquaculture is very rapid, greater than 10% per year for most species, while the contribution to the total from wild fisheries has been essentially flat for the last decade. In the U.S., approximately 90% of all shrimp consumed are farmed and imported. In recent years salmon aquaculture has become a major export in southern Chile, especially in Puerto Montt and Quellan, Chile's fastest growing city. Farmed fish are kept in concentrations never seen in the wild, e.g. 50,000 fish in a two-acre area, with each fish occupying less room than the average bathtub. This can cause several forms of pollution. Packed tightly, fish rub against each other and the sides of their cages, damaging their fins and tails and becoming sickened with various diseases and infections. Some species of sea lice have been noted to target farmed coho and farmed Atlantic salmon specifically. Such parasites may have an effect on nearby wild fish. For these reasons, aquaculture operators frequently need to use strong drugs to keep the fish alive but many fish still die prematurely at rates of up to 30% and these drugs inevitably enter the environment. The lice and pathogen problems of the 1990s facilitated the development of current treatment methods for sea lice and pathogens. These developments reduced the stress from parasite, pathogen problems. However, being in an ocean environment, the transfer of disease organisms from the wild fish to the aquaculture fish is an ever-present risk factor. The very large number of fish kept long-term in a single location produces a significant amount of condensed feces, often contaminated with drugs, which again affect local waterways. 
However, these effects appear to be local to the actual fish farm site and may be minimal to non-measurable in high current sites. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. Integrated multi-trophic aquaculture IMTA, is a practice in which the by-products from one species are recycled to become inputs fertilizers, food, for another. Fed aquaculture e fish, shrimp, is combined with inorganic extractive e seaweed, and organic extractive e shellfish, aquaculture to create balanced systems for environmental sustainability biomitigation, economic stability product diversification and, risk reduction, and social acceptability better management practices. Multi-trophic refers to the incorporation of species from different trophic or nutritional levels in the same system. This is one potential distinction from the age-old practice of aquatic polyculture, which could simply be the co-culture of different fish species from the same trophic level. In this case, these organisms may all share the same biological and chemical processes, with few synergistic benefits, which could potentially lead to significant shifts in the ecosystem. Some traditional polyculture systems may, in fact, incorporate a greater diversity of species, occupying several niches, as extensive cultures low intensity, low management within the same pond. The integrated in IMTA refers to the more intensive cultivation of the different species in proximity of each other, connected by nutrient and energy transfer through water, but not necessarily right at the same location. Ideally, the biological and chemical processes in an IMTA system should balance. This is achieved through the appropriate selection and proportions of different species providing different ecosystem functions. The co-cultured species should be more than just biofilters, they should also be harvestable crops of commercial value. A working IMTA system should result in greater production for the overall system, based on mutual benefits to the co-cultured species and improved ecosystem health, even if the individual production of some of the species is lower compared to what could be reached in monoculture practices over a short-term period, sometimes the more general term. Integrated aquaculture is used to describe the integration of monocultures through water transfer between organisms. For all intents and purposes however, the terms IMTA and integrated aquaculture differ primarily in their degree of descriptiveness. These terms are sometimes interchanged. Aquaponics, fractionated aquaculture, IAAS, integrated agriculture aquaculture systems, IPUAS, integrated peri-urban aquaculture systems, and IFAS, integrated fisheries aquaculture systems, may also be considered variations of the IMTA concept. Topic: <laughs> Shrimp. A shrimp farm is an aquaculture business for the cultivation of marine shrimp or prawns for human consumption. Commercial shrimp farming began in the 1970s, and production grew steeply, particularly to match the market demands of the USA, Japan and Western Europe. The total global production of farm shrimp reached more than 1.6 million tons in 2003, representing a value of nearly $9 billion. About 75% of farm shrimp is produced in Asia, in particular in China and Thailand. The other 25% is produced mainly in Latin America, where Brazil is the largest producer. The largest exporting nation is Thailand. Shrimp farming has moved from China to Southeast Asia into a meat packing industry. Technological advances have led to growing shrimp at ever higher densities, and broodstock is shipped worldwide. Virtually all farmed shrimp are peniards, i.e., of the family Paniidae, and just two species of shrimp the Paneus vanomae, Pacific white shrimp, and the Paneus monodon, giant tiger prawn account for roughly 80% of all farm shrimp. These industrial monocultures are very susceptible to diseases, which have caused several regional wipeouts of farm shrimp populations. Increasing ecological problems, repeated disease outbreaks, and pressure and criticism from both NGOs and consumer countries led to changes in the industry in the late 1990s and generally stronger regulation by governments. Regulation In various jurisdictions, intensive animal production of some kinds is subject to regulation for environmental protection. In the United States, a concentrated animal feeding operation CAFO that discharges or proposes to discharge waste requires a permit and implementation of a plan for management of manure nutrients, contaminants, wastewater, etc., as applicable, to meet requirements pursuant to the Federal Clean Water Act. Some data on regulatory compliance and enforcement are available. In 2000, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency published five-year and one-year data on environmental performance of 32 industries, with data for the livestock industry being derived mostly from inspections of CAFOs. 
The data pertain to inspections and enforcement mostly under the Clean Water Act, but also under the Clean Air Act and Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Of the 32 industries, livestock production was among the top seven for environmental performance over the five-year period, and was one of the top two in the final year of that period, where good environmental performance is indicated by a low ratio of enforcement orders to inspections. The five-year and final year ratios of enforcement – inspections for the livestock industry were 0.05 and 0.01, respectively. Also in the final year, the livestock industry was one of the two leaders among the 32 industries in terms of having the lowest percentage of facilities with violations. In Canada, intensive livestock operations are subject to provincial regulation, with definitions of regulated entities varying among provinces. Examples include intensive livestock operations Saskatchewan, confined feeding operations Alberta, feedlots British Columbia, high-density permanent outdoor confinement areas Ontario, and feedlots or parks d'ingressement Manitoba. In Canada, intensive animal production, like other agricultural sectors, is also subject to various other federal and provincial requirements. In the United States, farmed animals are excluded by half of all state animal cruelty laws including the Federal Animal Welfare Act. The 28-hour law, enacted in 1873 and amended in 1994 states that when animals are being transported for slaughter, the vehicle must stop every 28 hours and the animals must be let out for exercise, food, and water. The United States Department of Agriculture claims that the law does not apply to birds. The Humane Methods of Livestock Slaughter Act is similarly limited. Originally passed in 1958, the act requires that livestock be stunned into unconsciousness prior to slaughter. This act also excludes birds, who make up more than 90% of the animals slaughtered for food, as well as rabbits and fish. Individual states all have their own animal cruelty statutes, however many states have a provision to exempt standard agricultural practices. In the United States there is a growing movement to mitigate the worst abuses by regulating factory farming. In Ohio animal welfare organizations reached a negotiated settlement with farm organizations while in California, Proposition 2, Standards for Confining Farm Animals, an initiated law was approved by voters in 2008. Regulations have been enacted in other states and plans are underway for referendum and lobbying campaigns in other states. An action plan has been proposed by the USDA in February 2009, called the Utilization of Manure and Other Agricultural and Industrial Byproducts. This program's goal is to protect the environment and human and animal health by using manure in a safe and effective manner. In order for this to happen, several actions need to be taken and these four components include Improving the usability of manure nutrients through more effective animal nutrition and management Maximizing the value of manure through improved collection, storage, and treatment options Utilizing manure in integrated farming systems to improve profitability and protect soil, water, and air quality Using manure and other agricultural byproducts as a renewable energy source. In 2012, Australia's largest supermarket chain, Coles, announced that as of January 1, 2013, they will stop selling company branded pork and eggs from animals kept in factory farms. The nation's other dominant supermarket chain, Woolworths, has already begun phasing out factory farmed animal products. All of Woolworths' house brand eggs are now cage free, and by mid 2013, all of their pork will come from farmers who operate stall free farms. Topic controversies and criticisms Advocates of factory farming claim that factory farming has led to the betterment of housing, nutrition, and disease control over the last 20 years, while opponents claim that it harms wildlife and the environment, creates health risks, abuses animals, and raises ethical issues. In the UK, the Farm Animal Welfare Council was set up by the government to act as an independent advisor on animal welfare in 1979 and expresses its policy as five freedoms, from hunger and thirst, from discomfort, from pain, injury or disease, to express normal behavior, from fear and distress. There are differences around the world as to which practices are accepted and there continue to be changes in regulations with animal welfare being a strong driver for increased regulation. For example, the EU is bringing in further regulation to set maximum stocking densities for meat chickens by 2010, where the UK Animal Welfare Minister commented, the welfare of meat chickens is a major concern to people throughout the European Union. This agreement sends a strong message to the rest of the world that we care about animal welfare. Factory farming is greatly debated throughout Australia, with many people disagreeing with the methods and ways in which the animals in factory farms are treated. Animals are often under stress from being kept in confined spaces and will attack each other. In an effort to prevent injury leading to infection, their beaks, tails and teeth are removed. Many piglets will die of shock after having their teeth and tails removed, because painkilling medicines are not used in these operations. 
Factory farms are a popular way to gain space, with animals such as chickens being kept in spaces smaller than an A4 page. For example, in the UK, debeaking of chickens is deprecated, but it is recognised that it is a method of last resort, seen as better than allowing vicious fighting and ultimately cannibalism. Between 60 and 70 percent of 6 million breeding sows in the U.S. are confined during pregnancy, and for most of their adult lives, in 2 by 7 feet (0.61 by 2.13 meters) gestation crates. According to pork producers and many veterinarians, sows will fight if housed in pens. The largest pork producer in the U.S. said in January 2007 that it will phase out gestation crates by 2017. They are being phased out in the European Union, with a ban effective in 2013 after the fourth week of pregnancy. With the evolution of factory farming, there has been a growing awareness of the issues amongst the wider public, not least due to the efforts of animal rights and welfare campaigners. As a result, gestation crates, one of the more contentious practices, are the subject of laws in the U.S., Europe and around the world to phase out their use as a result of pressure to adopt less confined practices. Death rates for sows have been increasing in the U.S. from prolapse, which has been attributed to intensive breeding practices. Sows produce on average 23 piglets a year. Topic. Human health impact According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention CDC, farms on which animals are intensively reared can cause adverse health reactions in farm workers. Workers may develop acute and chronic lung disease, musculoskeletal injuries, and may catch infections that transmit from animals to human beings such as tuberculosis. Pesticides are used to control organisms which are considered harmful and they save farmers money by preventing product losses to pests. In the U.S., about a quarter of pesticides used are used in houses, yards, parks, golf courses, and swimming pools and about 70% are used in agriculture. However, pesticides can make their way into consumers' bodies which can cause health problems. One source of this is bioaccumulation in animals raised on factory farms. Studies have discovered an increase in respiratory, neurobehavioral, and mental illnesses among the residents of communities next to factory farms. The CDC writes that chemical, bacterial, and viral compounds from animal waste may travel in the soil and water. Residents near such farms report problems such as unpleasant smell, flies, and adverse health effects. The CDC has identified a number of pollutants associated with the discharge of animal waste into rivers and lakes, and into the air. Antibiotic use in livestock may create antibiotic resistant pathogens. Parasites, bacteria, and viruses may be spread. Ammonia, nitrogen, and phosphorus can reduce oxygen in surface waters and contaminate drinking water. Pesticides and hormones may cause hormone related changes in fish. Animal feed and feathers may stunt the growth of desirable plants in surface waters and provide nutrients to disease causing microorganisms. Trace elements such as arsenic and copper, which are harmful to human health, may contaminate surface waters. Intensive farming may make the evolution and spread of harmful diseases easier. Many communicable animal diseases spread rapidly through densely spaced populations of animals and crowding makes genetic reassortment more likely. However, small family farms are more likely to introduce bird diseases and more frequent association with people into the mix, as happened in the 2009 flu pandemic in the European Union. Growth hormones are banned on the basis that there is no way of determining a safe level. The UK has stated that in the event of the EU raising the ban at some future date, to comply with a precautionary approach, it would only consider the introduction of specific hormones, proven on a case-by-case -case basis. In 1998, the European Union banned feeding animals antibiotics that were found to be valuable for human health. Furthermore, in 2006 the European Union banned all drugs for livestock that were used for growth promotion purposes. As a result of these bans, the levels of antibiotic resistance in animal products and within the human population showed a decrease. The international trade in animal products increases the risk of global transmission of virulent diseases such as swine fever, BSE, foot and mouth and bird flu. In the United States, the use of antibiotics in livestock is still prevalent. The FDA reports that 80% of all antibiotics sold in 2009 were administered to livestock animals, and that many of these antibiotics are identical or closely related to drugs used for treating illnesses in humans. Consequently, many of these drugs are losing their effectiveness on humans, and the total healthcare costs associated with drug-resistant bacterial infections in the United States are between $16.6 .6 billion and $26 billion annually. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus MRSA has been identified in pigs and humans raising concerns about the role of pigs as reservoirs of MRSA for human infection. One study found that 20% of pig farmers in the United States and Canada in 2007 harbored MRSA. 
A second study revealed that 81% of Dutch pig farms had pigs with MRSA and 39% of animals at slaughter carried the bug where all of the infections were resistant to tetracycline and many were resistant to other antimicrobials. A more recent study found that MRSA ST398 isolates were less susceptible to tiamulin, an antimicrobial used in agriculture, than other MRSA or methicillin susceptible S. aureus. Cases of MRSA have increased in livestock animals. CC398 is a new clone of MRSA that has emerged in animals and is found in intensively reared production animals primarily pigs, but also cattle and poultry, where it can be transmitted to humans. Although dangerous to humans, CC398 is often asymptomatic in food-producing animals. A 2011 nationwide study reported nearly half of the meat and poultry sold in U.S. grocery stores—47% was contaminated with S. aureus, and more than half of those bacteria—52% were resistant to at least three classes of antibiotics. Although staff should be killed with proper cooking, it may still pose a risk to consumers through improper food handling and cross-contamination in the kitchen. The senior author of the study said, "...the fact that drug-resistant S. aureus was so prevalent, and likely came from the food animals themselves, is troubling, and demands attention to how antibiotics are used in food animal production today." In April 2009, lawmakers in the Mexican state of Veracruz accused large-scale hog and poultry operations of being breeding grounds of a pandemic swine flu, although they did not present scientific evidence to support their claim. A swine flu which quickly killed more than 100 infected persons in that area, appears to have begun in the vicinity of a Smithfield subsidiary pig CAFO concentrated animal feeding operation. Topic: <laughs> Environmental impact. Intensive factory farming has grown to become the biggest threat to the global environment through the loss of ecosystem services and global warming. It is a major driver to global environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. The process in which feed needs to be grown for animal use only is often grown using intensive methods which involve a significant amount of fertilizer and pesticides. This sometimes results in the pollution of water, soil and air by agrochemicals and manure waste, and use of limited resources such as water and energy at unsustainable rates. Entomophagy is evaluated by many experts as a sustainable solution to traditional livestock, and, if intensively farmed on a large scale, would cause a far lesser amount of environmental damage. Industrial production of pigs and poultry is an important source of GHG emissions and is predicted to become more so. On intensive pig farms, the animals are generally kept on concrete with slats or grates for the manure to drain through. The manure is usually stored in slurry form slurry is a liquid mixture of urine and feces. During storage on farm, slurry emits methane and when manure is spread on fields it emits nitrous oxide and causes nitrogen pollution of land and water. Poultry manure from factory farms emits high levels of nitrous oxide and ammonia, large quantities and concentrations of waste are produced. Air quality and groundwater are at risk when animal waste is improperly recycled. Environmental impacts of factory farming include Deforestation for animal feed production Unsustainable pressure on land for production of high-protein, high-energy animal feed Pesticide, herbicide and fertilizer manufacture and use for feed production Unsustainable use of water for feed crops, including groundwater extraction Pollution of soil, water and air by nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizer used for feed crops and from manure Land degradation, reduced fertility, soil compaction, increased salinity, desertification Loss of biodiversity due to eutrophication, acidification, pesticides and herbicides Worldwide reduction of genetic diversity of livestock and loss of traditional breeds Species extinctions due to livestock-related habitat destruction especially feed cropping Labor Small farmers are often absorbed into factory farm operations, acting as contract growers for the industrial facilities. In the case of poultry contract growers, farmers are required to make costly investments in construction of sheds to house the birds, buy required feed and drugs, often settling for slim profit margins, or even losses. Research has shown that many immigrant workers in concentrated animal farming operations CAFOs in the United States receive little to no job-specific training or safety and health information regarding the hazards associated with these jobs. Workers with limited English proficiency are significantly less likely to receive any work-related training, since it is often only provided in English. As a result, many workers do not perceive their jobs as dangerous. 
This causes inconsistent personal protective equipment PPE use, and can lead to workplace accidents and injuries. Immigrant workers are also less likely to report any workplace hazards and injuries. Market concentration The major concentration of the industry occurs at the slaughter and meat processing phase, with only four companies slaughtering and processing 81% of cows, 73% of sheep, 57% of pigs and 50% of chickens. This concentration at the slaughter phase may be in large part due to regulatory barriers that may make it financially difficult for small slaughter plants to be built, maintained or remain in business. Factory farming may be no more beneficial to livestock producers than traditional farming because it appears to contribute to overproduction that drives down prices. Through forward contracts and marketing agreements, meatpackers are able to set the price of livestock long before they are ready for production. These strategies often cause farmers to lose money, as half of all U.S. family farming operations did in 2007. In 1967, there were 1 million pig farms in America. As of 2002, there were 114,000. Many of the nation's livestock producers would like to market livestock directly to consumers, but with limited USDA inspected slaughter facilities, livestock grown locally can not typically be slaughtered and processed locally. Topic. Demonstrations From 2011 to 2014 each year between 15,000 and 30,000 people gathered under the theme We Are Fed Up, in Berlin to protest against industrial livestock production. <laughs> Fast food The meat that is used in fast food industries often comes from factory farms because of the low prices. The animals that the meat comes from are treated with drugs and antibiotics for the purpose of accelerating weight gain, and preventing disease in crowded and unsanitary farming conditions. However, these animals suffer greatly because their internal organs and bones can not keep up with the rapid increase in weight. Chickens that go through this process can hardly take a few steps because of their underdeveloped bones. The antibiotics used on the animals can have a negative effect on the consumers as well. When a certain antibiotic is issued to a group of animals for a long period of time, the bacteria residing in the animals will develop a resistance to the drug. If a person consumes improperly cooked meat with drug-resistant bacteria and becomes sick, that person would become unresponsive to any antibiotic treatment. There have been regulations implemented on fast food companies to restrict the usage of antibiotics. Surveys and tests are conducted on industries to determine their antibiotic usage rate, and each industry is issued a grade ranging from an A to a F as of 2018. Only two fast food chains earned an A and 11 earned a F. <laughs> See also